present uh, this, uh, this topic uh, to you today. I understand that uh, there are many world experts in uh, the field of uh, spinal cord. So it was, uh, a very, it was not an easy task for me to come up with a presentation that uh, I, will, I will try to keep their interest. And uh, I understand that we also have many junior colleagues that uh, they're new to the field. So I felt that we need to provide some more background information that uh, they might find uh, useful. So uh, we, we have to cover many topics, so I'll, I'll start. So uh, I'll start with a quick clinical case. So this is a 67 year old man with uh, some uh, balance issues and neck pain that goes up to eight out of 10. <clears throat> and there is a small disc herniation that you can see here and the slight uh, spinal cord def deformation of the axial uh, cuts. But on the flexion extension MRI, you see here on the, uh, the extension that the stenosis gets worse while on the flexion, the stenosis gets better. You can see here the spinal cord, the CSF, so this is a kind of borderline case, whether we should offer surgery or, or not. There are some factors like the spinal cord signal change here that shows that there's some kind of uh, you know, active inflammation going on in the spinal cord that will lean us towards surgery, but his symptoms have remained stable. So we have opted to closely monitor him. And uh, on top of all the other things, there is a degree of, uh, um, degree of uh, I will call it instability, but hypermobility of the cervical spine. And you can see that on the, on the lateral views, there is a degree of spondylolisthesis. And if we actually measure that, it's 1.8 millimeters. And when he's flexing the head, that uh, degree of spondylolisthesis goes up to 3.5. So again, a very borderline case. And uh, we have opted to monitor him after explaining you know, all the options, the, both the surgical options and the non-operative options. But uh, the real... Uh, you know, the, the real issue here is that we're not certain what is the best option for him. So someone might consider the previous case as kind of uh, an esoteric, like neurosurgical di dilemma that probably doesn't apply to, you know, to a rehabilitation med uh, doctor or to, you know, a, a general, a general uh, medical doctor. But there's this recent study that uh, they're talking that uh, the prevalence of um, asymptomatic cervical spinal cord compression can be as high as 24%. So these MRIs like the one that we saw might be much more common in general population and thus the threshold for getting an MRIs and uh, the availability of MRI becomes higher and higher. We might be seeing more of these uh, findings in many cases that might be incidental. So it's important to be familiar with the topic of spinal cord compression and cervical myelopathy. And uh, this study, they argued that the prevalence of myelopathy might be as high as 2.3% in the general population. Uh, I, I won't take that number as an absolute number, but it's an indication that this is a relatively common disease that I think that we should all be familiar with. And uh, it's uh, now regarded as the most common cause of spinal cord dysfunction. And actually, there are some people who call the degenerative cervical myelopathy as a spinal cord injury in slow motion because we're dealing with spinal cord injury, but in a more like chronic uh, way of, uh, of developing. And uh, somebody might say that the previous patient had mild symptoms, didn't really affect that much his quality of life, but is this the case with all the DCM cases? And uh, this uh, study a few years ago, they actually saw that uh, for the uh, SF36, which is a common quality of life uh, metric, the cervical spondylotic myelopathy, and uh, a quick note here, this condition, it can be referred as CSM or DCM, we're basically referring to the same thing. So they, they have a very low quality of life, both in the physical component, also the mental component. It was only the back pain that had a lower mental component and all the chronic heart fail failure that had a lower physical component. So again, I won't take these numbers as absolute comparison between the pathologists, but uh, it is an indication that um, myelopathy can definitely have a big impact on patient's quality of life. So let's take a step back. Uh, what is the de degenerative cervical spinal disease? So this is part due to normal aging, but also their lifestyle factors. And we also know that some of the anatomical changes that happen with myelopathy, they kind of propagate and bring more degeneration to, uh, to, to, the, to the spine. And uh, like uh, with most spinal pathology, they, they, it can present with uh, the degenerative spinal, uh, cervical spinal disease can present with three main symptoms, axial pain, radiculopathy and myelopathy. We don't really know exactly what is the prevalence and what is the relationship because uh, th there are many there are many challenges in actually quantifying the epidemiology of these diseases. Uh, they, they're not always present. Uh, they, they, they might fluctuate over time. And also for myelopathy, as we will see a little bit later, it's not really clear 
what should be the diagnostic criteria for myelopathy. So a few things about the degenerative spine disease. Again, one of the first things that happen, we believe, is the degeneration of, uh, of the disc that brings uh, then several changes that lead to stenosis and uh, also instability. And about uh, myelopathy, we believe that it starts with uh, the compression or the, the deformation of the spinal cord that, that can be either continuous, being there all the time, and we usually call that a static, or intermittent, and we call that dynamic. We, we saw in the previous example that that patient on, on flexion and extension, there was definitely a, a significant difference in the anterior posterior diameter of the spinal canal. So there is a, a dynamic component of uh, spinal cord compression in many of these cases. Another condition that uh, can cause myelopathy, and we used to consider as a separate entity, but now it falls within this degenerative cervical myelopathy spectrum, is the ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. And you see here the ossification. You can also see here the ossification. And the question that frequently comes up is how much stenosis uh, is, is required in order to cause myelopathy? And uh, I, I really like that study. It's not a new study, but uh, I still think that is probably the, the best evidence we have. And it showed that actually there's not like a, a very absolute cutoff point. But what they found is that uh, when the anterior posterior diameter of the canal is more than 14 millimeters, none of the patients had myelopathy. When it was less than six millimeters, all of them had. And uh, between six to 14, which is actually the usual anterior posterior diameter of the canal for, for many people, uh, it, it depends. And uh, there are many factors that we still don't know what will make a, a patient to develop myelopathy versus another one who doesn't have. And uh, some of the factors we think that there might be uh, the increased range of motion, like again, the first example that we saw that that patient had hypermobility on flexion extension of the cervical spine. And when we have a patient with um, cervical myelopathy or we suspect cervical myelopathy, we do the standard clinical evaluation that uh, we, we take the history, we assess for any red flags for serious spinal conditions like uh, weight loss or any, any recent trauma, weight loss is for, for cancer or recent trauma that might suggest traumatic etiology. We ask specifically about myelopathy symptoms and uh, we'll see what this might be. And then we do the standard neurological exam. Uh, and uh, it's very, very important to do a thorough motor strength exam and also to assess the gait. Uh, we believe that the gait is a very, especially the tandem gait examination, is a very sensitive um, clinical finding for the general cervical myelopathy. And uh, here's a little bit more comprehensive uh, table of uh, the signs and symptoms of, of DCM. Uh, the, the ones that I would like to emphasize is the loss of manual dexterity. This is uh, very common and very early in the disease. The patients usually describe that uh, they feel that they has, their hands are clumsy. They, they, cannot, uh, they cannot use their phone or they cannot use their fork and knife when they're eating as, as well as they did before. And gait imbalance is also very, very common and a very early sign in the course of the disease. But we need to remember that there is not like a single finding that uh, will allow us to place the diagnosis. Usually it's a combination and there's active research right now that, that we're doing to see uh, if, if there's one symptom or sign that is more sensitive, more specific uh, than, the, than the others. Here's a questionnaire that uh, actually addresses the four uh, main symptoms or very common symptoms of myelopathy. It's more targeted for primary care physicians uh, to allow with the early diagnosis of myelopathy. So these, these are, again, the four main symptoms that uh, we see or we hear very frequently from patients. They describe that they, they're dropping things, uh, the balance might be off, and uh, they might feel weakness in, in, in the arms and numbness as well in, in the arms. And uh, they found that uh, if uh, the answer is yes to three or more of these uh, questions, then there's a very high uh, sensitivity to pick up myelopathy. And uh, there are many clinical skills for, for myelopathy. And, uh, you know, while in traumatic spinal cord injury, we all use INSKI, uh, but that's not a very good scale for um, DCM because, uh, first of all, it takes a lot of time, requires like specific training, and is not sensitive to pick up uh, the subtle changes that uh, these patients have in the early phases of the disease where it might be just some dropping of, uh, of things, some numbness, some the, the balance might be off, which, uh, although they might not sound as serious as you know the motor deficits of a traumatic spinal cord injury patient, but for a highly functional individual, they can have a significant effect um, in their daily activities and their overall uh, functional status, as, as we saw with, the, with one of the studies. 
So uh, also, you know, what another challenge is that the spinal cord, can, you know, um, controls so many functions, and uh, it's very difficult to come up with a relatively short uh, clinical outcome. So short to evaluate uh, clinical outcome scale that will also be comprehensive. And uh, these authors they they suggest that we should actually track more than one clinical outcome, and um, like the MJOA, and we'll, we'll see what these are. So the first uh, my love of clinical scale was this by Nurik. We don't really use it that often anymore, although it's a, it's a simple but uh, it's a simple outcome measure, but it doesn't really capture all the granularity in the disease. Uh, the most common uh, scale is uh, the modified uh, JOA, where basically we assess four different uh, functions. Uh, one is the uh, motor function of the upper extremities, motor function of the lower extremities the sensory function of the upper extremities, and uh, we check also the bowel and the bladder. We ask about the bowel and the bladder, actually the bladder. So this is the most commonly uh, performed um, evaluation or the most commonly used clinical outcome scale. It goes from uh, zero to 18. Another is the, the pain scale that uh, we use because it's very commonly present in TCM patients. And then this is the neck disability index, although it's not specific for myelopathy, but uh, we also says that uh, as with all uh, cervical, spinal, uh, cervical spine diseases. And this is a quality of life uh, outcome measure that we also use very, very frequently. So the differential diagnosis of DCM is actually quite extensive. And um, in cases where we, we have a degree of stenosis, but we are not convinced that this is the cause of the symptoms. We very commonly refer the patients to, to neurology because as you can see here, this, uh, this list uh, is, is, is already pretty extensive and it's not, it doesn't include all the, all the different diseases that can mimic uh, DCM. So in, in these cases, we just refer the patient to, to an expert to investigate further. If, if we're not convinced that the compression of the spinal cord is enough to cause the symptoms. In, in regards to the imaging workup, we get uh, very frequently x-rays. Uh, we saw in that previous patient, we also added the flexion extension because it can reveal dynamic instability. We also get an MRI without contrast. And in some uh, special cases where the patient has a lot of uh, hardware, metal hardware, and there is a lot of metal, uh, magnetic artifact, or if, if there's a contraindication for MRI, then we might get CT myelography. And uh, also when we're planning to do surgery, we very frequently get a CT scan to see the bony anatomy in greater detail. But again, when we're evaluating the findings, uh, we should try to correlate them with the patient's symptoms because the stenosis is actually, it can be very, very prevalent. It doesn't mean that every patient with stenosis will also have myelopathy. And uh, that's something we try to clarify with this, uh, with, with this publication. Where in some diseases, like if, if you have uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, you get the CT scan, you see the hemorrhage, and then you can place uh, the diagnosis that the patient has hemorrhage. But that doesn't apply for DCM because, uh, again, as we said, there are patients that they might have stenosis without myelopathy. And uh, in these cases, in DCM cases, we get the imaging to support the diagnosis that um, is already, we already have the clinical suspicion that the patient has this disease. And it's also to rule out any, any other any other conditions. So it's not so much to rule in the diagnosis, but more to support and rule out any other conditions that might mimic uh, the DCM. And there is some ongoing research. Actually, they, they have found that uh, DCM can cause changes in the brain. And we know that very well from spinal cord injury that uh, there, is, uh, there are changes that happen in the brain, both at the cortex, uh, at the cortical level, but also at the brainstem level or the thalamic level. As, as a response um, to, to the spinal cord injury. And uh, also, in addition to the regular MRIs, we have some new modalities that we're still investigating if they can provide us with more information for, for DCM. In, in regards to the neurophysiological workup, it is uh, very, very helpful uh, basically when uh, we want to rule out other conditions like peripheral neuropathy. It, it's a very common clinical scenario to have a patient with gait problems in the degree of stenosis, but they also have like a significant diabetes. So in these cases, we don't know if we're dealing with diabetic neuropathy versus DCM. And in these instances, uh, the nerve conduction velocities, EMG, um, SSCPs can be, can be very helpful. And uh, also during the surgery, we always monitor these patients with motor evoke potentials and somatosensory evoke potentials to make sure that the surgical maneuvers don't cause any, any additional 
compression or any additional injury to, to the spinal cord. And uh, we're, we're still we're still not clear about what the role of uh, these modalities are to, to monitor the disease. The reason is that we don't have very specific changes in DCM that will make the neurophysiological workup more more useful for monitoring the disease or to quantify the spinal cord dysfunction. But this is an area of active research and we might be this might change in the, in the next years. So another thing that uh, is um, is commonly uh, we commonly see that in, in the literature are the physical performance tests uh, for the diagnosis of DCM. And there's this recent study that uh, they saw that all these tests actually they perform uh, well for detecting and monitoring the DCM, but uh, they are not very practical to administer them in, in the, you know in the office setting. And uh, there, there might be an opportunity for further research to see if one is is better than the other. So probably we can do that or probably refer the patient to uh, physical therapy for a more thorough evaluation of this um, uh, of these tests. And, uh, you know, these tests are, can be can be helpful, but uh, there are some people who argue that this is kind of uh, an outdated way to, ass to assess the physical performance of the patients. Now we have all the wearable technologies like, you know, we have the watches that can monitor many physiological parameters and they do that continuously. So probably in, in the near future, we might have applications uh, through the wearable technologies that will allow us to assess a little bit better the physical performance of these patients. And also there are some people who claim that computer vision might have an, an application where instead of us trying to quantify, for example, how many seconds it took for the patient to do the nine hole back test, then a computer vision might be able to assess if there is any tremor, if there's any in inaccuracies in, in the patient views, you know, trying to perform the test and do that uh, more easily and more objectively than any kind of uh, evaluation by, 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 a human, um, by a human. So there are definitely opportunities for further research in that field. And uh, there is, uh, in, back in 2013, there, there was a study that saw that there is actually a significant delay from the initiation of symptoms to the diagnosis of uh, myelopathy. And uh, this has to do again with the fact that uh, it might present with subtle findings, and uh, initially they might the primary care physician might attribute these changes to normal aging, or they might uh, they might not take uh, the complaints very seriously because initially they're they're very subtle. And uh, you know, several years later, actually there was not much progress in that other study. They, the patients reported that there was a delay one to two years between onset of symptoms and. Uh, and getting the diagnosis. And to make things even worse, there was a recent study that they were basically claiming that uh, this disease is not only there might be a delay in diagnosing, diagnosing the disease, but there might be a significant uh, other diagnosis or other recognition of the disease. So uh, one of the limitations is that we don't have very robust diagnostic criteria about what what constitutes myelopathy and when we can safely place the diagnosis. So uh, I'll show you a few, uh, a few things from the research that we're doing right now. So we try to review the literature and see how authors in clinical studies, they have defined myelopathy and uh, how, how they were able to place the diagnosis. And uh, you know, we, we consider that that can be like a proxy for coming up with uh, some objective uh, diagnostic criteria. And uh, we, we did a literature search, but we came up with like 1,600 different studies. So it was, it was basically impossible to analyze that, let's say, manually, or it was very, very you know, laborious to do that. And we consider several approaches on how we can analyze the data from all these studies. And uh, we, we, we realized that uh, these three options can be very time consuming. So we explore a little bit better whether the newer techniques of uh, NLP can help us with that. So what is NLP? NLP is a branch of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, you can do many, many things with NLP, uh, but I will focus on topic modeling and text summarization. So uh, what, what is topic modeling? So it, you, give, uh, you give a text to, to the algorithm, to the, to the software, and the, the software tries to detect either any patterns or any, any topics that emerge from, uh, from, from the text and can do that in several different documents. And then come, uh, comes up with uh, a probability of uh, whether a topic is present in a specific uh, area of the text. 
So just to give you an example, we we fed uh, the algorithm with uh, all the data from uh, this literature review, and then uh, the the algorithm came up with some word clouds like that, uh, and these were the topics that the the algorithm detected uh, in uh, in the text that we we, we fed the, the algorithm. And uh, then uh, this is up to the experts in the field to try to make sense of what these words might mean. And uh, we we gave all the word clouds to a group of experts, and uh, we we agree that this is more like more likely referring to a motor dysfunction. So probably one of the criteria that we need to use for the diagnosis of DCM is that there must be a motor dysfunction. And there are a couple other models. Uh, again, this has not been published yet, and we're still working on it. So these are not the final results, but I just want to give you an idea of how that process goes. And this is another another word cloud that came up, and uh, it, it contained very diverse terms like severity, progression, and uh, we had trouble, you know, understanding what this might mean. And uh, again, because there was so diverse, all the, the words here, we couldn't come up with like a unifying thing, theme that will kind of bring all this together. But then we realized that this might be some modifying or as we call it, reinforcing factors that in some questionable cases of uh, myelopathy, they might uh, make us lean towards the diagnosis of TCM. For example, if there is uh, progression of, uh, of, the, of the findings, if there is any instability, if there is any intramedullary signal, then it is more likely to be myelopathy versus not being myelopathy. And another technique that we use is the summarization. And uh, this is actually, it, it can have multiple applications in medicine, I believe, uh, especially now that the medical, medical literature has been growing so fast and uh, it's very difficult to catch up with all the, all the new publications that come up and all the new journals that come up, I would say every day. So the text summarization uh, provides like a concise summary and uh, it gives us the important features from, from the text. So we don't have to read the whole text ourselves, but just get the important points from, from the algorithm. And uh, there are two ways to do that, uh, actually three ways to do that. One is the extractive fashion where the algorithm picks up some sentences or some words that are considered very, very important and considers that these sentences convey the important uh, aspects of, um, of, of the text. And then there is the abstractive fashion where the sentences uh, they don't necessarily pre-exist in the text, but uh, it's a way that the algorithm can summarize the data and uh, present, present the data to us. And then there are several ways to combine the two techniques. So let me show you how that looks. And uh, so these are two summaries that uh, came up with uh, the abstractive uh, summarization. And um, actually it doesn't, doesn't look very bad. And as you can see here, although this is an automated process, but uh, there are some, we call them hyperparameters, some instructions that we give to the algorithm. And actually uh, you can modify these hyperparameters to a significant degree and get different results. And uh, this is still kind of uh, an art, meaning that there are no very specific rules on how you should modify or how you should, let's say, fine tune these, um, these hyperparameters and uh, how you can get like a better summary of, uh, of the text. But uh, for, for example, here we, we had uh, a more lenient uh, length penalty, meaning that the algorithm was coming up with a longer text. Here we had a, a smaller, uh, length penalty and uh, the alg algorithm came up with a uh, with a shorter text. And uh, here's an example of uh, the extractive uh, summarization followed by abstractive summar summarization. And uh, th this is again a way that uh, the technology can help us summarize the data from uh, multiple publications. And uh, although you know we're still at the early phases of this uh, new technology and uh, they're still you know, not performing optimally, but uh, the, the, the way they are growing is it, it's really exponential. I mean, every, every few months we have a new model, we have a new significant progress in the field. And uh, I believe that, uh, and not, not, not only me, but many people believe that uh, it will be very, very useful in the near future. And uh, I, I always like to, to show that graph here, which is about growing a business, but also applies for anything that grows exponentially. So our minds are used in thinking about linear growth and they're not, so much used in thinking about exponential growth. So this the new technologies initially, they, they, they grow exponentially and there's always like a lag in the initial phases and uh, we explore them, we're not uh, really impressed by them and then we kind of dismiss them. But these technologies continue to grow, continue to grow. There is like uh, this, this point that 
they really then start to be much much better than we're expecting and they start to impress us so with uh, nlp uh actually i think we're, we're at this point if not beyond that point already so let's go back to the, the myelopathy how how we treat it so there were some guidelines published a few years ago and uh, this is the long version of the guidelines and uh, I, I won't really read them but uh, this is the short version that basically we we do surgery we offer surgery and we consider conservative treatment only if the symptoms are very mild and they're not progressing and if there are like significant comorbidities or the patient is, is of advanced age and the reason is that uh, myelopathy is a progressive disease and also the outcome is related to the symptom duration. So if a patient comes to us and has symptoms for like six months, you know, has a better chance of improving after surgery versus somebody versus delaying the surgeon offering the surgery a few years down the road. <clears throat> and uh, you know, another thing that uh, usually comes up is, is there any role for non-operative treatment? And uh, this literature review, again, from a few years ago, identified some shortcomings of uh, the non-operative treatment for, for DCM. First of all, in, in the literature, they don't really define very well what is the non-operative care. And they include very different modalities like traction, bracing. And even when they describe these modalities, the, the details of the treatment are not very well, uh, very well defined. So other people define traction as several hours per day, others several, just a couple of times per week. And uh, so it, it's, it's unclear. So there is no some kind of standardization that allows to, to draw some kind of um, uh, conclusions. And uh, also in, in terms of the, of the medication, some, there, there are many publications that report uh, that there was some kind of medication therapy, but this is not well defined. But also they, they have done uh, the, the non-operative treatment in patients regardless of, their, uh, of the severity of the DCM. And uh, we now know that uh, for severe and moderate um, severity disease, then uh, surgery is a better option. So that there's several limitations from, from the literature and uh, there, there might be some actually research opportunities for the non-operative uh, DCM treatment. And um, I think that uh, there's been more focus of, um, of offering uh, non-operative uh, care in mild cases and we need more clinical studies specifically for mild cases of DCM. Also, in regards to the post-operative care, this is not really standardized, and I think that there is uh, room for developing standardized protocols for DCM patients after the surgery. And uh, in regards to what might constitute a structured program, we, we think that strengthening of the neck muscles is very, very important, and probably isometric exercises work better because they can offer the, the muscles strength and benefit Without placing too much uh, stress on the on the musculoskeletal system, or on the skeletal system actually, then uh, spine posture we think is also very very important. Uh, work ergonomics, uh, targeted spine interventions can help with the pain that these patients might have, and can facilitate a more effective physical therapy. And uh, there, there is some early evidence that uh, these patients should avoid uh, excessive flexion. Or, or extension, uh, but the moderate flexion should be safe. So probably if we kind of standardize these instructions to or this type of treatments, in mild cases, we might be able to find something interesting. In regards to the surgical options, there are several surgical options. Uh, we usually divide them in anterior, posterior, or combined approaches, and also uh, divide them in whether we're doing a fusion where we lock the bones together, where we, where we, whether we preserve the motion uh, with an instrumented uh, operation, whether we're doing all decompression or hybrid approaches. I'll show you a few examples. So in, in regards to, uh, to selecting uh, anterior versus posterior approach, there are many factors that come into play. Either it's multi-level stenosis, we usually go from the back. If there is anterior compressive pathology, we usually go from the front. But remember that if we do a posterior decompression, the spinal cord kind of shifts back. So in this case, although there was this, this herniation compressing the spinal cord, and here we did the laminectomy. You see that the spinal kind of sifted more posteriorly, and although the disc is still there, but it doesn't have any kind of compressive effect uh, to the spinal cord. In regards to anterior pathology, there are two main options. One is to do the fusion, where we are removing the disc, placing a, a, some kind of graft over there. Here is the allograft, 
and we place uh, screws and place to lock the bones together. And eventually, we want these two bones to fuse together and become a single bone. In this case over here, we remove the disc and we place an artificial disc. And although it sounds uh, like a much better option, actually might be a much better option in many cases, there are some limitations of that technique. You cannot use it in every case. There are some contraindications. And uh, also, we're lacking some kind of uh, more long-term data about uh, whether these devices are still functioning 20 years down the road. Well, with ACDF, it remains the gold standard. You do the fusion. If the bones fuse together, you don't have to worry ever again about that, uh, that level of the spine. Uh, I would like to show you a video now, just to give you a visual of uh, how uh, an operation like that is being done. So this is a case of 58 year old lady with uh, right arm, uh, with uh, arm weakness. And you see that she has a significant, let me go back. She has significant disc herniation at five, six. And actually this disc herniation is uh, very, very calcified. It's more like what we call osteophyte disc complex. You see it's more bone here. And uh, here's the approach. Uh, just to orient you, the head is to the left, the feet towards the right, the midline is over here. And over here, we're doing a, a dissection and we're gonna dissect between the carotid artery and between the esophagus and the trachea. So this is the plane that we have developed and uh, we're already on the spine over there and we're developing the spine with this, we call them peanuts. And also we use scissors to cut through the prevertebral fascia. And uh, here is, is the spine again. And here we use the cautery to expose the bone and to elevate the longus coli muscle. Just to give you a few uh, anatomy, uh, here's the longus coli muscle and, and the anterior lateral aspect of it is the sympathetic chain. So we soon injure that area because then we can give uh, the patient a Horner syndrome. The carotid artery is here, which we also need to be very careful about for obvious reasons. The esophagus a little bit more medially. And uh, in the spine, a little bit more deep around here is the vertebral artery that we also need to be, be aware of its location. So many, many important structures in, in a very, very close to where we're working. Uh, here we're placing the self-retaining retractors. Here is the spine after the cauterization. This is a pin that we put on the bone and uh, that will allow us to distract uh, the disc space and open it up. And there are several advantages with opening up. It makes the discectomy easier and helps us correct any, any kyphotic deformity that might be present over there. So you see here, we place the knife to start the discectomy. You see the disc materials like, you know, is, is this cartilage that we're gonna remove? A little bit more soft material. And we use a combination of instruments to perform the discectomy. And here we use a high-speed drill bit to drill the posterior osteophytes. And uh, over here, we're very close to, to the spinal cord. So that's why we use that instrument to confirm whether we have removed all the bone or whether we need to remove more bone. And there's still bone present there. So we're going to continue drilling to make sure we remove all the bone. And uh, what is like one millimeter deep to us is the spinal cord. So th this is where we're working. And uh, this is the drill. This is where the tip of the drill is. And this is where the spinal cord is. And here's some different views of whether, where, where the instrument is and uh, how close the spinal cord is to where we're working. So that's why we go very, very closely. You see here, there's a bony fragment that we're trying to retrieve and remove it, but it doesn't want to come out. So at this point, we decide to work on the opposite side. And uh, this here is the posterior longitudinal ligament. And uh, you'll start seeing as we remove that ligament, you start seeing this glossy white area. This is the dura. So this literally, you know, the, the spinal cord is right over there. So we need to be very, very careful not to apply any additional pressure to, to the spinal cord. And uh, here, now we go about after this uh, residual piece of bone. And finally, we're able to, to retrieve it. And uh, here we're completing the decompression. We want to see the, the dura were very well decompressed. And uh, here we use the sizer as a metallic uh, instrument that uh, will help us choose the, the right size of, of the graft. 
And here is the allograft. So basically is born from a donor that is cut in a, in a safe that will, will fit in that space. We're removing the pins. Yeah, we'll put some bone wax on the on the bone to get hemostasis. And over here, we're working on the on the next level. And after we're done, I, I didn't show you the other level. It was basically the same thing. Uh, we're removing some osteophytes that will allow us to place the plate and uh, to fit it a little bit better on the front surface of the of the spine. So here we're opening the holes for the screws. Here we're locking, they have a locking mechanism that we activate here. Basically rotate that to lock them, to prevent the screws from kicking out. And these are the x-rays after the surgery. Uh, again, this is, uh, it was an ACDF, which is the most commonly done operation, one of the most commonly done operations for myelopathy. Uh, another operation we frequently do is uh, posterior Another approach actually is the posterior approach. And there are two main options for that is the laminoplasty versus the laminectomy infusion. And you can see the difference here. Here is the, the vertebra before the surgery. And uh, in the laminectomy, we have removed the lamina. And, but because you have very, we, we have very important muscles attached to the spinous process, if we just do the laminectomy, then there's a very high risk for developing kyphosis after the surgery. So that's why we need to put the instrumentation, the rods and the, and the screws to lock the bones together and to fuse them together. In the laminoplasty, we weaken the bone over here. You see there's a, a trough that we made here. And then we lift the bone up and place a plate to keep it up. And uh, we give a much more space for the spinal cord, which is in this area. But we preserve all the important structures, all the, all the important bony structures for the stability of the spine. So in that case, we don't need to fuse the spine. Again, it's a very, it's, it's a beautiful operation, but not every patient is a candidate for, for laminoplasty. There's some specific uh, contraindications. Mainly, there is instability in the spine, either significant kyphosis or significant neck pain. And actually, we, we have uh, developed like a modification to the, to the technique, because what we realized is that uh, when you only do the, uh, the laminoplasty, because the spinal cord kind of sits posteriorly, there were some cases that the spinal cord was getting kinked by the edge of the bone over here. So we felt that it's very, very important when you do that operation to trim off the bone at C2 and C7, basically at the cranial and caudal end of the operation. And uh, our experience with this uh, modification is actually very, very good. I mean, even patients uh, with uh, significant pain did better after the surgery. There was significant reduction in the axial neck pain, but also significant neurological improvement in these patients. And, and again, this technique seems to be working very well in, in our patient population. And there are some uh, hybrid constructs where we might choose to do both a laminoplasty and a fusion. This is something uh, we've done a couple of times. We, we're still trying to figure out what is uh, its role you know, in our armamentarium and you know, in our list of uh, surgical options. Uh, so this is still an, uh, an active of, uh, a field of active research. Now, I'd like to say a few things about the spine alignment. So we know that the spine should be aligned, meaning that the bones should be roughly one over the other, and there should be no significant kyphosis or coronal plane imbalance because then uh, the, the muscles of the spine need to uh, work harder to maintain the, that alignment. So this is usually called cone con of economy. And we have very well-established criteria for lumbar spine. Uh, and uh, recently we started uh, realized that uh, the same criteria or similar criteria can be applied for the cervical spine. And here we see the most, the, some of the most commonly used. I would like to um, just uh, point out to the uh, cervical sagittal vertical axis. So basically is the distance between the C2 and the C7 if we draw a plumb line from C2. So the higher the distance is means that the base has more uh, flexion of, of the overall of the, of the spine, more kyphosis. So there is more work for the extensor muscles of the spine to keep the head up. So this is not optimal in patients with uh, CS, CSVA, more than four centimeters, they usually have much higher pain and um, not as good quality of life. So one of the goals that we have with surgeries is to restore the normal lordosis and, and uh, give as much, uh, uh, as much improvement uh, in, in, the, in the spinal alignment um, parameters. So 
Uh, I would like to show you another field of active research that we do. So this is how we position the patient during the surgery, prone position. And uh, you see that there is a horizontal traction here. So we have applied the garden well tongs. You see here that uh, these are tongs that they get attached to, to the skull. And through these tongs, we apply the horizontal traction. But during the surgery, we have the option of changing the vector of the traction towards the ceiling to induce more lordosis or to elevate this support for the face, again, to give uh, more lordosis to the cervical spine. So for example, here, uh, I'd like to show you two intraoperative x-rays. So this is how the spine looked by having only the horizontal vector of, of traction. And then when we change to both this oblique traction and also elevating the head, you see that we got a better alignment, better lordosis of the cervical spine. So we are actually actively trying to figure out which technique work, works the best. So we combine the elevation and the oblique traction. So we use one of the two. And uh, so this is what we're actively looking. Um, and uh, this is a pre-op and post-op. You see how we gave more lordosis to the, to the spine. And he, here's the pre-op and post-op MRI. Another thing that we're actively looking at is uh, what is the quality of life for patients who undergo long posterior fusions? Because we know that 50% of the range of motion of spine comes below, from below the C2. The other 50% comes between the head and the C2. So in theory, losing 50% of the range of motion is associated with significant, should be associated with significant reduction in the quality of life. But our impression is that this re residual 50% is more than enough for the daily activities that we very rarely use 100% of the range of motion of neck. Uh, but again, this is something we are actively looking at with our patients to see if this is, if this is the case or it's just a false impression that we have. Now, in terms of uh, surgical prognosis, there are several publications that uh, they report uh, that uh, uh, surgery can have a very good uh, uh, outcome. And uh, they, have, uh, uh, they have established that at different time points. Uh, as you can see over here, the overall effect is definitely positive towards, towards improvement. And uh, this is for the JOA. So this is for the neurological outcome. Uh, this is for the overall neck disability. And you can see that is uh, also significantly improved uh, at multiple time points. And, uh, you know, th these previous uh, publications were, were, were just describing, you know, what, what, is, uh, what is the overall outcome. So there have been some efforts in trying to quantify or trying to prognosticate a little bit better. So this is a more recent publication where they're trying to provide some, uh, an easy to implement uh, prognostic uh, scale uh, about uh, who, will, who will respond or who will not respond to surgery for, for TCM. And they identified that uh, the preoperative kyphosis, the number of levels that there is um, compression in the spinal cord from both the anterior and the posterior, and uh, also the length of uh, the spinal cord changes, they call them the intermedullary lesion. So they, they found that these three factors are very important for uh, predicting what is the, the outcome from DCM surgery. But DCM surgery is not risk-free. There are several complications that can happen. Some of them, they're, they're rare, but uh, some of them are serious, but hopefully, uh, thankfully they're rare. For example, spinal cord injury, injury to the carotid or the um, vertebral artery, injury to the esophagus. Some others, they're rare, but they're more easily uh, managed or they might be self-limiting. Like if there's uh, injury to the recurrent lar laryngeal nerve from anterior approaches because we're working very close to that nerve, or as we, as we discussed, you know, there might be Horner syndrome if we injure the longus coli muscle. But um, mo most of these are, or some of them can be self-limited. For example, the recurrent laryngeal nerve injury most of the times is a neuraprexia. So basically it was just from the retraction of the nerve and it gets better after a few weeks. Very rarely if it is due to a transection of the nerve that is associated with a permanent, uh, permanent deficit. But what we deal with uh, most commonly is um, if we do a fusion that the bones might not heal together, might not fuse together. Uh, if we do a fusion, we might see additional disease at the areas above and below the areas that we fused. And uh, another common, uh, not common, but uh, um, a complication that we see from time to time is the C5 palsy. It's basically is weakness to the deltoid and biceps muscle after, after surgery. So here is a publication that I tried to come up with a percentage of uh, well, what is the cumulative incidence of these complications. 
But uh, all, all these uh, studies, you know, they, they provide us with uh, an overall view or some overall description of uh, what the outcome would be or what the complications might be. But they are not very specific uh, for, they're, they're not individualized. So I'd like to show you uh, an area of active research that we do. And uh, we're using the data from the uh, National Surgical Quality Improvement Program of uh, the American College of Surgeons. So this is, the probably, this is probably the biggest database that we have for, for surgeries. And uh, we have applied some newer type of uh, analysis, basically machine learning algorithms. And uh, they have several advantages over the more traditional, let's say logistic regression or linear regression. First of all, their overall methodology, they, they, you, what you do in this case is you take 100%, you know, all the data, 100% of them, and then you split them into train. So you split in 70% for, for training the algorithm. And then you keep the 30% of the data that the algorithm never, never sees. And you come up with a model and then you, you check that model with, uh, with the test data and see how well that model performs. So it's a very, uh, it's, it's a clever way to do like an internal validation of, of the model. And uh, also these algorithms, they're, they're very good because they can detect nonlinear relationships. So for logistic regression or linear regression, there's this assumption that an increase in one value leads to an increase in another value in the outcome or you know, an increase in one of the predicting features uh, has a linear relationship with one of the outcome uh, measures, but this is not always the case. And uh, these algorithms, for example, the exit boost, gut boost, these newer machine learning algorithms can actually detect nonlinear relationships. And uh, they overall, they, they provide higher uh, prognostic uh, and predictive accuracy than logistic regression. And they also allow for uh, more accurate uh, predictions at the individual level. So I'll show you here how one of our the websites look for spinal tumors, but as I said, we're actively developing a very similar one for cervical spine surgeries. So you go here and you insert the age, the sex, you know, all these parameters that um, they can have a predictive uh, uh, value. And then uh, the algorithm can give you a specific prediction for that, for that individual. So it can show you that uh, there's an 8% chance for a prolonged length of stay. Uh, versus 20% for a not prolonged length of stay. And that's specific for that patient, not just for the patient population in general. And uh, also it allows you uh, to assess what is the overall feature importance, both uh, at uh, the individual level. So let me go back here. So this is at the individual level. So the algorithm shows us that these feature values are very, very important to predict the long, uh, length of stay for that specific patient. But the algorithm can give you also uh, some estimations about what are the features that are important for the overall patient population. If you, if you want to do some population-wide intervention, then this is a more helpful um, feature important scale. So for example, here it shows that age, uh, uh, this specific uh, CPT code, uh, and uh, for example, if the American uh, Society of Anesthesiology class is two, so all these values probably they are associated with uh, higher, they, they have a higher importance for the patient population. So uh, I will stop here to uh, allow time for, for questions. Um, thank you for your attention.